This episode of the Final Furlong Podcast is brought to you by the 2024 Weatherby's Cheltenham Festival Betting Guide. Order now to secure your copy and use the bonus code FF24CF to get £5 off your purchase. It's the complete guide to the festival with every fact, stat and trend covered to help you make the most informed bets throughout the best week of the year. To get £5 off your purchase of the print and digital editions as well as the print and digital bundle, use our exclusive bonus code ff 24 or CF at checkout at weatherbyshop.co.uk. Welcome to the Final Furlong Podcast. I'm Emma Kennedy, and we get to talk about my favorite division for Cheltenham, the Novice Chasers, with two of my favorite pundits, Adam Mills, race planner and French racing expert, and the author of Weatherby's Horses to Follow, and crucially, the Weatherby's Cheltenham Festival Betting Guide, which this podcast is brought to you by Paul Ferguson. Boys, welcome to the show. Let's begin with the Novice Chasers and the two models. Marine Nationale is still favourite for the Oracle, despite disappointing in the Irish equivalent. 5-2 to two is the top price currently available. The Irish winner, Ilete Tomp, William Mullins, who's won five Oracles, four of his Oracle winners came from the Irish Oracle, having won that race. He's available currently at 4-1 to one shot. Adam, I'm going to start with you. What is your overall thoughts on the Arkle, and does Marie National 5-2, to two, can you see your way to backing him after disappointing last time out at Leopardstown? No, I, I, I don't really. This market sort of played my head a bit yesterday when I went through it and tried to put some kind of sense to it. Because really, what, what price should Marie National be? No one really knows. He could be a 6-4 to four shot. He could also be 33-1 to one shot. I've watched back the Irish Arkle. I've tried to sort of understand what happened with him. Don't really know. If you came to that race fresh and you didn't know the result, as you get to the second last, you'd be thinking, this is going all right for the favourite. He's travelling fine. And then he just cuts out. Maybe, maybe if I was really trying to make an excuse for him, he was possibly on the wrong part of the track. I think coming to the stands rails seemed to be slightly better ground, but not enough to make you want to take five to two. And I guess the thing that would really worry me is having made a mess of the last, it's not like he goes again, he empties and, you know, as much as I love Sharjah, Sharjah comes past him. I, I'm just not sold. I would want to. I definitely wouldn't want to take the five to two. I, I'd almost. I wish they'd come out and said we found a problem. We found yeah. an issue with his wind or an injury or something to make me think that there was a reason for that performance. But I, I really don't think you can take five to two about a horse in the Arkle who's had who's won a beginners chase, not being a great deal, and who's had a run like that. And it's kind of, it's, he's priced up because he won the Supreme last year. And don't forget, you know, he was odds on for this race before the DRF. So the market can't exactly push an 8 to 13 shot out to 20s. But if I was pricing it honestly, I'd probably want at least 10s before I'd even want to look at him. Ooh. I can't, disagree just, yeah. I can't disagree with that. I'd be very keen to get Paul's thoughts on it. I'm not buying the excuse either, Paul. I like Barry Connell awful lot. I think he's a fantastic trainer. Time for him called the ground on his Beginner's Chase debut, heavy, and it was soft ground at the DRF. I don't see how that can be the case. Yeah. So what is, what's your overall status on Marine National now? Yeah, as you'll remember, I was, horse. I was with throughout last season, so I was pretty excited about his prospects going over fences this year. Did nothing wrong on debut. Um, like like many people, I was I was pretty impressed with what he done, um, but I I thought, I just didn't think he was ever going. Like Adam said, there coming to the last or two hours, he'd, he'd still be pretty happy enough. I I didn't think he ever looked in the same kind of comfort zone. I didn't think through the Irish Arkle as he did in his beginner's chase. Obviously, he's up in up in grade, but I still expected him to travel with the same fluency almost because I, I I didn't actually think it was the strongest Irish Arkle neither. So it was. I was expecting him to win and win well, really. Again, I just echoed the sentiments, really. You'd be struggling. He's got 38 days to turn it around. Um, maybe he will, but a 5-2, to two, do you really want to be backing a horse in the article on the, on the back of um, such a disappointing run? And again, he, like you say, with the uh, the argument with the ground, I think he's got plenty of soft ground form over hurdles as well. I know he, he does strike like a horse. He would travel better on, on a nicer surface, but he says Royal Bond, I think the ground was pretty bad that day when he beat Irish Point out, but so... Um, yeah, and like Adam said, I think it would have been, it probably would have been better if if something had come to light and then you, at least he had a genuine excuse to 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 give him forgive him for that run. So yeah, 
like you say though if it doesn't look a vintage renewal so if he does bounce back to his best he could go and win but at the price i think he'd be probably he'd have to look elsewhere really there was just a slight suspicion about his breathing as well he wore a tongue tie and he wore a tongue tie then which people a couple of people flagged up it wouldn't have been wouldn't have been such an alarm and sign to me but obviously now the way he cut out did scream that maybe there is an issue with his um with his breathing and i thought then something might come to light but i'm guessing there probably wouldn't have been enough time to uh, do anything about that again so if he does disappoint in the article, I'm sure he'll be undergoing another, possibly undergoing wind surgery again during the summer. But um, yeah, just at the prices, I say like you said, if if there's a potential champion chase horse in the field, probably is him. But at the prices, I think we'd be best looking elsewhere. Reading last year's Cheltenham Festival betting guide, I was reminded of how many horses have won the Arkle with experience of either three runs coming into the race or five. What I would say with that is, and I've made quite a made a bit of a point of it this year. I think the novice races in. Yeah. With the exception, maybe the National Hunt Chase, which we'll, I assume we'll get to next. The novice races have changed and evolved over the past couple of years. You see, the last the two of the novice chases of the novice chases last year, El Fabiola won it on the back of two runs. The real Wacker only had two runs before he won the Brown Advisory. The three novice hurdles, again, the exception being the Mayor's novice hurdle. But for the past two years, the three novice hurdles have been won with all, by a horse who's run no more than twice over hurdles. So I think the way field sizes are thinning out and there's not as much depth to these novice races with there being more options. I think that such experience is becoming less significant. It wouldn't be overly concerning now because, you know, you're only going to get a small field. And I think that does does have an impact on what experience you require. That's a very good point about the real whacker as well, because if the argument is going to be, well, of course, El Fabiola did it. He's trained by Willie Mullins. Patrick Neville was able to do it last season as well. That's a very, very important point to make. We need Barry Carnell because we need somebody to be able to fight the awesome might of Willie Mullins' firepower. But I'm with Adam. If you were giving me ten to one, very very interested. But if you two, give me ten to one, I'd, if you give me ten to one, I'd take a chance. All right, but not a five to two, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, and listen, some of these bookmakers can be quite generous. None of them are that generous. I don't <laughs> yeah, imagine it, but I wouldn't be surprised if he was pushed out more on the day. Like happens, you can't you can't really be pushed out massively, and it's not like there's there's much standout opposition really. If it, in, in a, maybe in a stronger year it would have been it would have been the case to be for easier to justify pushing them out a bit further but um, i'm sure earlier liabilities and things are taken into account and stuff but maybe on the day they say nowadays we see at the festival normally in the morning the, the races when you tend to get the better prices these days if you really fancy something and you think you're getting a fair price then by all means get stuck in at non-runner no bet but if you're not hold Matt off until the day because you're going to get better prices on the day and he will not be this price on that on the day I, I can't see him being 6-4 to four. although then again Fasal Vega was heavily backed for the Supreme last year yeah he was yeah. completely bombed out at the DRF before that as well and that's another thing these novice chases at Cheltenham again reading the excellent Weatherby's Cheltenham Festival betting guide uh, points to the fact that horses who win these graded novice chases they're all in form they've either won or finished second last time out horses who bombed out rarely very, very rarely do it. Extremely rarely. Adam, talk to me about the, the rest of the field as you see it, because when you compare the British ratings to the Irish ratings, there is nothing between these horses. Well, well, well there isn't. And I think that's also partly why, as Paul said, touched on there, that's why Marine National is 5-2, to two, because it's not like Marine National bombed out and something else won the Irish Arkle by 10 lengths and everyone could get stuck into it. Ilate Tom found a 50 I don't think there's much between them. I think Ilate Thompson is probably a little bit overpriced. You know, you have to think the form he's got in the book is fairly solid. The run at Limerick was good. This was a good win. He's quite a battler. I, I sort of think if I had to have like a dirty each way, he'd probably be the way I'd go because I think he'll run his race and he'll probably be in the three, but he doesn't like excite me that much. Fatal Vega... We'll probably touch on when we do the turners, but I just think he's tripless. I'm not really, I wouldn't back him for any race. And then it's kind of, you're looking at, I, 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 it's got so bad. I was thinking about being back in a British novice, which is kind of like a sign of the state we're maybe in. You know, JPR1 and Matata are quite closely matched. Their form is maybe being a bit overlooked. I think people look and go, oh, it's only Lingfield. But actually, the, the, this isn't a vintage year. They could run well. <laughs> The, the one I'm kind of I'm drawn back to is my old mate Quilixios, who I owe quite a bit to Quilixios, but I just think maybe he's been a little bit overlooked. I know you, you and I have had long conversations about the, the state of Mr. Policeman, but I think because Mr. Policeman was so bad, <laughs> the race at Nace has maybe been overlooked a little bit. And I really like the angle with Quilixios because although it's not always seen as a positive that a horse has an injury, 
The fact he's a triumph hurdle winner who's had a year off is going to be massively in his favour. He won a three-year-old hurdle in 2020 before he was even three, officially. His birthday is the 16th of March. He won on the 2nd. And that was the only three-year-old hurdle run before racing shut down due to COVID. So he kind of got through his triumph year. He had a year in the wilderness, as many five-year-olds do. Misses a year. It's come back over fences. I think he's run really well. I quite like... I, kind of find myself being drawn back to him as he's going to travel quite nicely. I think he's got the speed for two miles. Maybe with a with a, a decent ride he could win, but again, it's it's such a mess. I can't really find myself finding a pecking order and there's no point back in Colixios now because he's around a nine-to-one shot when I looked this morning. He's going to be that on the day. He's not from the Mullins yard. He's not likely to be heavily punted. You know, Henry de Bromhead could come out and say, we think he's a certainty and he's still only be sixes. So there's not really a great deal of movement. But it's just the makeup of this race. I just find it really hard. I can't even really do a pace map to work out what would I think would go forwards and try and lead. So I don't want to sit on the fence too much, but I just I can't find anything that really excites me massively the two that i think are overpriced the Ilite tomps maybe is a point or two bigger than he should be on the actual form he's got in the book and you know if, if marine national wasn't here Ilite tomps would have to be the 11 to 4 favorite maybe because he's won the irish arc and he's got the form in the book and then calixios jpr won i could see him traveling well but i'm not sure his jumping really holds up under massive pressure I think back to that race in November when he had the race one and he came down. Yeah, it doesn't. Once horses do that once, it kind of rings a few alarm bells for me. I'm, I'm really not sure, Emmett. To be honest, that 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 would be my my thought process. That Colixios will probably run quite well. I think Ilate Tom will run his race, but any one of six could win this quite easily. It's I don't think it's a vintage renewal. I think it's competitive without a standout. You know, if I if I was the owners of and um, connections of El Fabiola, I wouldn't be looking at next year's champion chase thinking, "Cool, that Arca winner's a bit tasty." So, for that reason, I'd, I'd I'll wait to the day and probably just have a small play on Colixios for a bit of interest. One quick one, and I need to update these stats uh, fully, but I think Rachel and Henry have got a twenty percent strike rate at Cheltenham together, which is just extraordinary. But there's a negative one. There was a negative one for him last year going into the festival. Henry de Bromhead didn't do well in handicaps, and then suddenly he was doing well in handicaps. But horses who avoided a graded race on their previous start, he's zero from 32 at Cheltenham. And Coelixios did not run on a graded race last time out. It was probably a graded class race for sure, just not in name. Would that be of any concern to you? No. Doesn't really, wouldn't worry me in the slightest because he's, he's a triumph hurdle winner at the end of the day. He's not, it's not like he's never been in a grade one before. We know he's a very professional horse. You know, I, I sort of like, you know, I've, I've voiced plenty of opinions. I mean, shot down for what Mr. Policeman should and shouldn't be doing, but he released one on Sunday. That form doesn't look so bad. And it's not like the, yeah. you know, if Polixios had run in the Irish Ark, where would he have finished? Probably in the first three or four. So therefore, yeah. he's got to have a chance in this. You know, Rachel Blackmore's a superb jockey. Her and Henry get on, you know, their Cheltenham record speaks for itself. That, that kind of stat doesn't really worry me. Particularly, I'd much rather look at the form of the horses he's beaten than what he's specifically running. Statistics like that, I mean, more more so. Like I, I think they're towards horses coming out of beginners' chases rather than he's obviously been in the winners' race last time. Like Adam points out, it was um, reasonable enough form. I think Calixios might run well as well myself. Actually, I, I'm, I had in my head that he might run well here and then go on to. I think Ainshield really suits him because when he was beaten, I think the change of tactics when he tried to. It's at Limerick when he he was dropped in. Um, sorry, on the second start he was dropped in. Over when you tried him over further, um, and I don't think that suited really. I think he he likes to go forward naturally, and he reverted to that last time, and that seemed to um, spark him back to life. So yeah, he'd be one. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be thinking he could go well, and then maybe go on to inch. I think two and a half at inch would really suit him to be on a flat track from the front. Um, around there. similar comments, I'd say to JPR one really. I think again before. The Irish article I was seeing JPR one as the leading British contender. See him running well here, maybe finishing the frame and then go on to look for his graded race at Aintree afterwards. We I'd echo what Adam said about his performance. I was really impressed with him at, at Lingfield, to be honest. I think out of any novice, just the way he went through the race, the way he travelled and jumped was probably um the best I've seen out of any two mile novice this season. I think again he would have no problem going up. Uh, it's two and a half. 
next time. But for now, he's definitely got the pace to win it. He would have won that Arkle trial easily. I thought he was a little unfortunate that it was kind of stumble after the fence rather than a um, a mistake on his part. So much the one disappointing run came. Perhaps it was the it was the background that sand down the court him out there. But again, you look and he started the season. He was only rated one thirty, so he's come more like from the handicap side of things. Whereas, but we do see that that like a couple of years ago in Edward Stone, when he was handicap earlier rather than a graded performer. So it it is possible when the, when the, it is a substandard renewal. Like if Marie National doesn't bounce back, this looks like it is a wide open renewal. Um, and again, I'd echo what Adam said with LF is hump and found the fifty. There's not much between them. Uh, and as I touched upon earlier, I was hoping that Marie National would go and beat them quite convincingly because I wasn't overly struck by the form of. Um, found the 50 of Christmas of the pair I'd probably at the trip I'd probably favour Alete Tom to confirm the form I think the slightly shorter trip at Cheltenham I don't think it'll be an issue he's a strong travelling horse and he, 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 he appreciates the drop and back in trip I thought having been beaten by Gaelic Warrior the time before concerned with Alete Tom because he's been twice been to the festival and finished fifth in the triumph and fifth in the supreme obviously he was nine lengths behind Marine National um, both horses seem to have improved for going chasing, which you wouldn't have necessarily thought about. Well, Eletti Tom is not the biggest. He wouldn't. He wouldn't have been more struck at the start of the season, saying he should improve for offence. But he has Hunter's yarn. Um, again, he, he'd be a horse I'd be more concerned about in terms of overall form because he's never actually run in a Grade One. So he, he'd be one I'd be saying where he is in the market on what he's actually achieved. But if you look at a strict form line through firm footings, he'd be firm footings by further than Marine National did. So if you're using him as a yardstick, um, you could possibly make a case for him in an open year. Again, I think JPR is pretty solid and he'd be one he'd be one I'd be looking at from an each way perspective. I think he I can certainly envisage him travelling really well to the foot of the hill and being involved in it. Whether he's quite good enough to win the race is another matter, but he'd be he'd definitely be the best of the British for me. And the other one that we haven't touched upon yet is Blood Destiny. Um I know the five year old record's pretty dismal since the weight allowance, the age allowance was removed. I think it's north from sixteen since two thousand and seven when that was the case. But we have seen twenty twenty Fakir Dudery probably should have won the race um as a five year old when he, he made the mess of the last and and put the kettle on as the winner. So again, in an open year, it is possible. They're, they're the kind of things you've got to take into account when, you, when you're looking at these statistics. Sorry, just ruling out five-year-olds and things, but if it looks a substandard renewal, then trends are there to be broken as well. Um, I thought he was really good on debut. Slightly disappointed with him last time, but I'm a, quite a big fan of Spillane's Tower. Um, mm-hmm. It could be that he just bumped into a good horse over his optimum trip, maybe coming back in trip and making use of uh, Blood Destiny's jumping. Um, he, was, he was good on debut. The forms worked out quite well with Hartwood coming out and winning that um, big handicap in the DRF. So he'd be, he'd be one I'd be interested in if there was a bit of cut in the ground from the front. And especially, as Adam said, it doesn't look any obvious. Maybe Colixius will go forward. Um, but I'd, be, I'd be keen to see if, if Blood Destiny was allowed to roll from the front. And he'd be, he'd be a slight inter- again, interest at double figures. But rather like Adam, I wouldn't have a strong conviction at this stage on the race. To, Looks still looks quite wide open and a bit up in the air. Blood Destiny was strangely absent from the William Mullins press day. He didn't even mention him. Now that doesn't mean he's not going to go to Cheltenham. It's just odd that there was no talk about him at all. The concern I'd have with Elite Tomp is that he's run a big race at the Dublin Racing Festival for the last two years and then just regressed to Cheltenham. He was beaten by further by Vaughan than on his hurdling debut in the Spring Juvenile Hurdle. He'd never run over hurdles. Well, his form at Leopardstown is much better than anywhere else, isn't it? That, much better. Something else that be yeah, he beat in the pocket by nine and a half lengths in the pocket finished in front of him in the Supreme last year. So it's limited evidence. It's only two runs, but it's not exactly encouraging. He does look to be a better horse of offences, though. And the point that Adam made is like he should be a shorter price. I would agree with that, too. I also think found a 50 should be a shorter price. Conventional wisdom seems to be that he'll be better going up and trip. I actually think the Arkle's going to suit him a hell of a lot better. He has the perfect blend of speed and stamina that will really suit, and he's going to be on the front end. And if Jack Kennedy kicks off the final bend... He might be really difficult to peg back. I couldn't have him out of the frame with a mallet. He's got an official Irish rating of 153, Elite Tom 154. Jello has an official British rating of 149. I love this horse. He reminds me a little bit of Lom Press in that he started out in handicap chases and then won a grade one at the Cheltenham Festival. Maybe Jello can do the same thing. He got wiped out at Lingfield, so that's not really a chase start at all. And then at Sandown, James Best gave Nickelback a superb ride from the front at a track configuration that was really going to suit Nickelback and I think everybody else in behind let him have way too easy a time of things and didn't ride their horses to best effect. And that might have been the case that Venetia Williams was just saying, look, get him around. 
Like that was a disaster the last day. Just get him around and build the confidence back up. He's 33 to 1. Either going to go for this or they'll go for the Turners. I couldn't tell you which of the two. I know Jess Stafford is doing a, a stable tour with Phoenicia today as we're recording on Tuesday for Racing TV. So hopefully she'll pinpoint which race they go for. But whichever one he does turn up in, I'd be really, really interested in him. Um, his sire has produced Ellie May, who was second in the Mayor's Bake, who famously won the Supreme Novice Hurdle after Jamie Codd put him up for his uh, on the Cheltenham preview. Uh, Imagine was fifth in last year's Martin Pipe and Jericho Rock was second in the Ultima. So the sire gets horses who, who go very well at Cheltenham. It's Phoenicia Williams. Her horses need to improve in form, but there's plenty of time for that to happen between now and then. And she tends to pop up at horses at big prices. So, And Charlie Deutsch is a fantastic jockey. So in an open year of the Arkle, I would go for Jello. He would be my pick at, at the moment um, at 33 to 1. I don't think he'd be that price on the day, but if we're going for the Irish horses, it's found a 50 for me. Uh, final selections, Adam? Calixios. That's Paul. tentative. Calixios. No, I tentatively go with JPR1 at this stage to hit the frame. Cowardly split stakes on Jello and found a 50, who I think will be a shorter price on the day. We're going to go up and trip as opposed to race card order. So, Paul, I'll give you a second to recalibrate as we switch to the turners, which Ile Francais would absolutely crush the opposition where he did turn up, but they're going to skip it. Ugh. The same person who told me that ha 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 Black Hercules is going for the turners after you backed him for the National on Chase sent me a message during the week going, Back to Files going for the Brown Advisory. How's your day going? Jesus Christ. Right. This is a race where we're struggling to find runners, basically. And the anti-post market is a complete mess. So, Adam, I want to start with you. If Gaelic Warrior goes to Cheltenham, which race is he going to go for? Arkell or the Turners? And would you fancy him for either? Uh, surely he goes for the Turners. You, you must think the new course at least gives him a chance. I... I'm not going to write him off as much as others have. You know, I think sometimes Gaelic Warrior gets, you know, there's an upset. he does probably need to go right-handed, but it's not impossible to think that he can get away with it on the new course. And I wouldn't normally use Asterian Falange as an example to any horse because he's also a nutcase, but Asterian Falange ran pretty well in the turn as he finished third. All right, that year Envoy Allen fell, so it kind of like, affected a bit but you can get away with it a little bit more on the new course I, I i think the leopardstown run was less to do with going left-handed and much more to do with this there looked to be an issue to me because it wasn't just like he was taking off and going to his right that he just never really traveled or right, i was a two-runner race it was a right mess you know, I, I, I would would I back Gaelic Warrior for the Turners? No, but it wouldn't surprise me if he came back to some kind of form. Whoever rides him has got to be really bold and just throw him out in front and hope for the best. The problem is he's going to lose two lengths at every fence. And it seems to be the further into a race he goes, the worse it gets. May, maybe they'll dodge it. Maybe they'll dodge it and they'll look and think we can get him right for Punchestown. You know, if if you what if they're insisting on going to Cheltenham, this is the only race that he can run in for me. I don't see how the Arkle would help at all because that track just he's gonna he's gonna lose too much ground and the speed he's going at he's gonna make mistakes. If he runs in the Arkle, I think he'll pull up. If he runs in the Turners, I could see him maybe finishing third or fourth, but he would have to be absolutely exceptional to give away a couple of lengths at every fence and still win. So he's not really on my radar for it. But that being said, th this isn't a classic Turners either. And if Factor File doesn't run, you know, you're looking then at what's even going to be favourite, maybe Ginny's Destiny. But he'd said at the start of the season, the favourite for the Turners is going to be a horse who's won a handicap, beating horses rated 137 and 123. I know he gave weight away in that race, but I, I don't know. I'm not really... Ginny's Destiny doesn't particularly excite me either. I'm trying to think outside the box with this race. But, you know, Gaelic Warrior, don't, if you have backed him, keep your slip. You never know. If you've backed him at the price Gavin Lynch put him up at, at 16 to 1 and 14 to 1, then absolutely hold on to your slip. But if you're looking at him at 3 to 1, no, no. he's got no chance. He's got absolutely no... This horse can't win at Cheltenham. It's, it's impossible for him to win at Cheltenham. 
the only the only thing I can come up with as to why he disappointed so badly the last day at Leopardstown is because he's jumping left-handed. And you can win a handicap hurdle going left-handed, but that's a hurdle race. Over fences, it's taking an awful lot more out of you. And you're just, if you're constantly jumping to the right on a track that's leaning to the left, at least at Leopardstown, there's actually straight sections where you're jumping. And to be fair, on the new course, most of the fences, in fact, the vast majority of them, you're jumping straight fences. There is one coming towards the turn, but you're still always leaning left. Always leaning left, even on the new course. You're right about the old course. He would be pulled up. It would be a complete disaster if they ran him in the Arkle, and it'll be a disaster in the Turners. I don't see how he can win it. But good luck to them if they're sending him over there. But And good luck to you if you're backing him. Not in a million years would I be back in Gaelic Warrior to win any race at Cheltenham, not to trigger at him. He got beaten by Brazil in the Fred Winter. Come on, lads, this fella's got absolutely no chance and should be going to Ferry House. He shouldn't even be on the boat over. Paul, your take on Gaelic Warrior? You'll make the market. In terms of natural ability, he's, he's probably the best horse in the race, but um, I'd have question marks now after the left side. To be honest, if he was mine, he'd be, be, he would be going to Ferry House because there's only... It comes up quite quickly after Cheltenham this year, isn't the way Easter falls. So mm. I think it's 17 days between that two and a half miles on the right handed track seems the, the optimum grade one for him, really. So that's what I'd be running. But I guess connections might want to persevere and have another crack at Cheltenham. Um, just on the back, I thought, again, like Adam said, I thought it looked a little bit more to it than just the jumping right the way he, he folded quite tamely, I thought. Um, so on the back of that run, I couldn't be, I couldn't be looking to back him in this race at a short price. Again, factor file, are we, are we assuming then, are we, that he's going the Brown Advisory? And I'm thinking that it's more a case of not where Willie Mullins is slotting him, and I think it's a case of where JP has run us, because Bowles yes. Cross obviously being taken out of everything else, and it looks like he's going for the National Hunt Chase. Um, Iroko is back in favour for this race now, having looked like he was going to be out through injury, so perhaps it's an owner-led decision, and um, and that that's why the factor file will go for the three-mile race. Hello. Mark Walsh did in, indicate after the win at the Dublin Race Festival of going up to in trip would be no bother to him and kind of hinted that that might be the way they'd go. Um, I know I was on just before the Dublin Race Festival and I wasn't as blown away as many by Factor File in his, when he won his beginner's chase at Christmas, but I thought he was pretty good. I don't know he's, he's beaten a horse who, who underperformed on the day, but um, I thought he was good at Fairy House. But if we're looking elsewhere, then look through a marked order. Ginny's Destiny has already touched upon He's made giant strides this season. Um, he actually won the time for Novice Handicap at the, on Trials Day off a of mark of 147. Stage started, won it off 142 last year before winning um, the Turners. So um, effectively, you could say he was slightly ahead of where the stable mate was at this stage of his career. Um, on a line through their meeting at the December meeting, Grey Dawn, and it would be of interest if, if the ground came up soft. And Dan Skelton said yesterday in... Um, record the video to say he's not definitely going for the Brown Advisory and if on soft ground he would be considered for this race and I think he'd be a he'd be a leading contender. He'd only have three quarters of a length to find. Um he'd be three pounds better off and obviously he made a, a serious error. I think it was the second last um, that obviously cost him more than that three quarters of a length. So I think strictly on that, if the ground was soft he would have to be of interest. Um Oroko's good horse he was he was really impressive on debut at um Warwick obviously won the Martin Pipe last year before he finished third in the Sefton. He's got a bit of grade, grade one form there. Going in on the back of such a lengthy break, it was the 7th of November when he made that chase debut. So I think that would be the concern there, be having been off for so long. Um, again, when I was putting the Cheltenham guys together, I was thinking of including them in the entry section. I thought more perhaps they would give them a small run somewhere and then look to go to entry for the grade ones. But Having looked through the programme book with that in mind, there wasn't actually much available to him. So again, it could be a case that the hand was forced slightly. And that's why he's coming here. Of those at bigger odds, Giovinco holds plenty of entries. Um, personally, again, he'd be one I'd be looking to send to entry uh, on a flat track. But if he was to go to uh, Cheltenham, he was entered in the ultimate yesterday as well, on mark of 146. I think he'll end up proving that mark that he's better than that. But if he was to go on the novice chase, I'd probably prefer him to run in this race. Um than in the Brown Advisory, I think. Again, I think this track with his front running style would suit. Um, although there would obviously could be a bit of pace on it because Ginny's Destiny will be ridden positively by Harry, no doubt. Um, but currently, at the odds, Giovinco would be, say, if he was confirmed for this race, he'd, he'd be slightly interested in those at bigger odds because, as you've said, this this race could easily cut up. There's, there's, how many have we got in there at the minute? 23. One of them is Ile France, he won't run. Yeah. Um, 
this could be this could easily be end up being a handful of runners really because you've got the cross entries. Basel Vega, I don't think we've touched upon. I think going up and trip will suit him and could unlock further improvement. So I'd be uh, I'd be hoping he steps up and trip below. He hasn't really overly impressed me with his jumping even when he won on debut. I wasn't totally taken by his jumping technique when he won at Navin. So um again of the of those at the top of the market say if it, if it's soft ground grade one would be the one who'd it probably interests me most. Dan Skelton was being asked for his best chances at Cheltenham. I think it was Matt Chapman asked him. Apologies if I'm wrong about that. And he said, great awning in the Brown Advisory. He posted a video this morning, or it was either this morning or yesterday. I was catching up this morning, and he, he, he recorded the video from the stable saying he's not committed to the Brown Advisory by any means, and if it comes up soft, the turners is a strong possibility. Is Dan Skelton learning from William Mullins? Is he just deciding it's going to be no, Dan Skelton no. bingo now as well? To be fair, there's just no need to. I like. I know the frustration of some people, but um, and some would say horses. But in in the circumstances, in this regard, I, I don't see any any reason why you do have to commit at this stage. He's so, say soft soft ground over the oh, on over this trip would suit him. I think so. Even with the whole Ballyburn thing, this has happened loads of times before, and I remember Brave yeah. Inca going for the Bearing Bingham, and on the Saturday before Cheltenham, Colin Murphy announcing, "Actually, we're going to go supreme." And he won. If Great Awning was put in here, that'd be interesting. And he might want to stay out of fact the his way. Yeah, again, like the, the, they might they might look at it near the time and think fact of, if fact the file goes there, fact the file stay away, Faye. That looks a stronger opposition than um maybe Ginny's destiny at the top of the market to say he's only got three quarters of a length to find on him after he made that mistake at the December meeting and he's three pounds better off. So um you you you'd be confident if you were you well, you'd be certainly be hopeful that you could you could put it up to Ginny's destiny and potentially turn the tables there. The weight in your favour. I like Ginny's destiny an awful lot, and I think he does deserve to be favourite in fact of file's absence if that's what William Mullins decides to do. But yeah. great honing would have yeah, been I, I, pri- I just think his pro- Yeah, I just think his price has contracted considerably since after he won on trials day. I think he was around five, six, seven, even seven to yeah. one. People were putting him up then as like a rock solid each way proposition, which he probably was at the time, but I say I suppose with what's happened since and the horses who might defect from the race, then I suppose by default he's now going to be um, short price favourites, and it's just the value seems to have uh, dried up out of him at the minute. Can we talk about Oroco? He's a Martin Pipe winner. Martin Pipe's been won by Sir Deschamps, Don Poli, uh, Banbridge went on to win a Grade One at Aintree, Gallopon Deschamps. Obviously, there's a good list of alumni from that race. As a speed figure expert, Adam, and I know your speed figures are more around the French racing, but as a form expert, can you point to any single piece of form, any speed figure, any time form rating, any RPR, any top speed figure that justifies Oroco being 4-1 to one for the Turners, and I'll go better, never mind the 4-1, to one. Any, any single piece of form that justifies him being 13-2 to two best price for the Turners novice chase? Well, I think you have to take the Martin Pipe into account. I think last year's Martin Pipe was a good renewal, and you've got to you've got to account for that. But you've also got to account for the opposition. If Iroko turns up in the same mood that he showed over fences in Warwick, and if he's over his injury, yeah, he should be in the first three or four of the betting because this is a if fact the doesn't run, this is a pretty average race. There's not loads of form leaping out. All right, the Warwick run, I can pull holes in it because Golden Sun hasn't done anything since. But I also think Golden Sun has left his best days behind him in France. So quite what that form is worth anyway, I'm not sure. But Kilbeck King was in that race. Quite fancy him for the National One Chase, which perhaps will come to get a tonic one over over hurdles at Newbury after that. And it's not like Iroko scraped home either. He won that easily. He's very impressive. Mm. I don't I don't really want to back a horse coming in with this prep, which would probably put me off. But equally I wouldn't be massively surprised if Iroko just turned up and and, and prove to be, you know, capable of winning a race like this. If you ask me right now at the prices, I don't actually have a bet in the Turners. Would I rather take the price about Ginny's Destiny or the price about Iroko? I'd probably back Iroko because there's more potential there. We know where we are with Ginny's Destiny. Done really well in handicaps, but I think Ginny's Destiny, I think, you know, Paul's get the nail on the head there that there was a bit of each way value because everyone thought he was, you know, he's definitely going to run in this race. And that's maybe why his price is contracted so much because everyone can be absolutely certain that on the third day of the festival, this horse is going to line up. So you can have a good bet on him because you're going to get a run for your money. 
I, I, it's difficult to say this. You know, you could look at the speed figures things, but at the end of the day, that was a small field at Warwick. Novice chasers, they're all kind of learning the job. You're not likely to get anything going off too hard in front to really tow them into it to run a big time. I'm not put off him, but I wouldn't be backing him either. But that's more because of the absence rather than what he's actually achieved. The horses have won at Cheltenham in novice chasers on the back of just one run. But has there ever been a novice chaser who's won at the Cheltenham Festival on the back of a break of 128 days or in and around that? I don't think so recently. In terms of them, once... Um once raced chases like so well chief um western warhorse western warhorse the other one they'd only won the beginners chasing or novice chasing january or february i think so it wasn't like that they'd won at a setback like like the case with the roger so again slightly concerned about the the day the layoff it'd be 128 days i know he went he, he reportedly had a school round um paydock after racing on saturday and um, what i would say in, in his favor about that the warwick run Aside from the form, he did show an aptitude to chase him, which you like to see on on debut. He was he wanted the jump and he was looking for the next fence, which is always a positive sign. He was, he was probably couldn't really crab anything about his jumping technique on first start out. So, um, in turn, in that regard, uh, you you could give, give him a positive mention, but just just I just don't like the fact that he say he's been off for so long and and that limited experience. Um, it's just. It's just concerning for me, really. Yeah, it's a major concern for me as well. Look, good luck to you if you're backing him. Yeah, yeah. Say, say that those other two winners, they, they've come in. They might have had limited experience, but they've arrived. At least you know they're in form and fitting well because they won that beginner's chase a month or, a month or so ago. So it's the it's the, the, the other way around with him, really. I think it's important with Western Warhorse. A lot of people use that as a stat, but he actually had a couple of runs over hurdles that season. Yeah, he and did, yeah, that's the same as that, that's, to, um, he went to Kempton on Boxing Day, and I know this because I actually backed him that day, and he bolted on the way to the start, so he didn't actually take part. But he kind of he did have a normal season in terms of his campaigning, cut the runs for yeah. Christmas. I think he went to Doncaster or something like that for his beginners chase. So it's kind yeah, of you should just you should mention that for um, the real whacker as well. He had one run over hurdles last year before, but in terms of chasing experience, obviously he only had two runs, but he had run in a handicap hurdle at the beginning of the season as well. Pre-season, you would have thought he'd have been more of a stay-in type because he looked, he looked to win the Martin Pike through stamina to me. And as a, as a five-year-old, stepped up into grade one company over three miles at Aintree, which is never to do, it's never easy for a five-year-old in the likes of the Albert Bartlett or the Sefton. And he ran really well. He quitted himself well. Starts off over fences. And I know he, he held entries over three miles to begin with. And then um, I remember talking to Josh at Aintree. I think it was a week or so before he ran. I think he was going to go to Weatherby for a three-mile race. And then he said that we decided that we want to start off over an intermediate trip. And John Joe said afterwards he showed a lot more pace over his fences, which is obviously due to his jumping technique being good, than maybe they expected to. So then it was it was never then thought that he would he would step up and trip this season. And indeed, when he when he came back into training, he was only actually handed the entries in the article or the turners. So um interesting the way to say pre-season you might have thought that if anything he was going to develop into a brown advisory horse but he seems to have uh, which we do which we see again we've seen factor file be another case i know obviously sounds like a bit of a contradiction because he is going to go three miles now but he seems to have shown more pace to me in his novice chase campaign than i anticipated him to i thought he looked through his bumpers i thought he looked like a real stamina laden horse who, who might want three miles whereas um the way he won, and say, you know, he'd be Gaelic Warrior who possibly underperformed, but the, the guys who like to um, do things on the clock and compare things with the handicap chase will tell you that he, he put up a stunning performance, even finishing a solo that day. Um, but just, just the way he went through the race suggested that, that an intermediate trip is absolutely no no issue to him. And sometimes that is the way a horse will jump that they become, they'll almost look speedier over fences, but it's just because of the way they'll go through the race and they'll, they'll take to the obstacles and things. So, um, again, I, I just think uh, if you, you can't, you can't imagine that to start the season that the, the, the plan was for a Roku to only have had one run. It's not, it wasn't the, the plan at the start no. of the season and he doesn't have graded hurt. It doesn't have graded chase experience. He doesn't have enough experience over fences in the first place. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, but one thing you... the day. It's fantastic that he's been out galloping. That's brilliant. He hasn't had a race. If race fitness didn't matter, then nobody 
would be prepping horses for Cheltenham. They'd all just go on the back of one run. Oh, well, we got to protect our horse for Cheltenham. Don't, this don't is start not... that. Don't start that argument. Oh. <laughs> certain examples like Tiuku clearly is better fresh. Yeah, like it's fair enough, but it's like as a as a general, that's not what we want to see, is it? You know what I mean? It's like no, it's, it's of, not. Of course not. not. That, but that's my game, point. But... You're looking at a horse who is thirteen to two for a Grade One novice chase on the back of one chase start, the form of which is suspect to say the least. If you look at his profile. Going back five, ten, maybe a little bit more years again, you, you'd be a lot more concerned about it than you would nowadays. You wouldn't, it wouldn't be totally out of the out of the question that there were like six or eight runners in this tennis. And and that, that's oh, where th- the, that's that's, that's where all there will be. Yeah, yeah well, it's that, going to be a six runner field the, with the with the options that connections have now, and the more the various options we have in the novice races. Obviously, it dilutes the races, but from a from it in terms of how many runners and that that does affect on the amount of experience a horse will need as Mr. has touched upon earlier. Because um, I think you can get a, you, there's more chance of getting away with inexperience these days in the novice races than there would have been 10, 15 years ago. Who is the pick so? Adam, who is going to be your bet in the turners as things stand? Ooh, as things stand, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe not sure, but there, there are a couple that I just thought I might take a swing on. The first is Imagine 25s this morning. Join, obviously come out of that dispersal sale. has gone to Harry Derham. Whether they're going to run or not, I'm not really sure. I, he's I, gonna I, run, I don't know if he's running here, but he is going to Cheltenham. Yeah, I, I, I quite liked his form. All right, he won, he won a four-runner race at Punchestown. He was one to three or 30 to 100 on or wherever he was. But the third was Uncle Phil. He's come out one since. He, you know, he didn't run his race last time. He bumped into Spillane's Tower. He's, you know, probably a, a bit... A bit better than he is. He was fifth in the Martin Pipe last year. I thought he's probably a little bit overpriced. You'd be taking guesswork as to how much time Harry Derham's going to get with him and what they're going to do. Thought he was kind of interesting. The other one who would need to be supplemented, I've no idea what the plan is with Hartwood, but I noticed that he wasn't in the entries for the plate when they came out. I, you know, that, that handicap win at the DRF is at least as good as Jimmy's Destiny put up if they were to supplement him here he'd definitely be on my radar but equally if they supplemented him he'd probably be fours so you, you know you got that one there is one just to, for left field he won't win this race if he even runs in it or if he runs in the brown advice but there's a horse right at the very bottom of the prices he's a five-year-old he's joined david pipe called jamaico he's got some very nice french form he's officially rated 124 he's not going to win this but in time, he'll be a nice chase. I thought it was interesting that they kind of, if he's going to run at the festival, he's in the Tisdale colours, he'll probably just be a social runner for the future. But I'll keep an eye on him. If I had to have a bet now, it would be imagine non-runner no bet. And I'd just take a chance that he's probably massively overpriced because no one really knows where he's going to turn up and what he's going to do. It's, it's just such a messy race. You know, on the day, I will probably lay Ginny's destiny if he's anything like five to two favourite. I'll be I'll just take the lay and have the field running for me. But it, it's another race that really revolves around, you know, if Factor Fall turns up here, he's probably what, even money? Assuming that he doesn't, then you've got a wide open race. But yeah, Hartwood and Imagine were the two I'd just keep an eye on that if either of them turns up in this race, I'll probably back him. Paul, who's your pick for the turners? This stage and um, on the assumption the Factor Fall doesn't run, um I'd be wanting soft ground, but Great one. I think it'd be interesting to go towards the top of the mark. Again, he, he would need soft to reroute here from the Brown Advisory. So. Adam Mills, what's your thoughts on the Brown Advisory? I mean, if Factor Far runs, he probably wins. I don't think there's a real... I'm not overly keen to take him on. I, I don't agree with the notion that Stay Away Fay is slow. I don't agree with that. I think Stay Away Fay is a good stayer. But I've seen enough from him to think there is speed there. The problem is... He's like when you've got a classic car that weighs two tons. It can go at a fast speed, but it takes a long time to get up to that speed. And I think I, I did a little bit of timing earlier in the season. I was a bit bored. When Stay Away Faye won at Sandown in that small field race when Giovinco was sort of 1.1 in running, it didn't go by him. But from the pond fence to the line, they were ran a quicker time than the two-mile handicap chase. Now, all right, the two-mile handicap chase was one by horse rate 122, so you've got to take that into account. But there is speed there. But the problem with Stay Away Fay is that there just there isn't a turn of foot. And if you watch the Cotswold chase, I watched it back on, on Monday, I think it was, you know, coming to the second last, Stay Away Fay's on the bridle, and you think he's probably the most likely winner. But then... They omit the second last, which you think if he's a dower stayer, that's got to be in his favour. But Capadano, who's a good horse, not a great horse, but he's a good horse, 
in the space of 10 yards, Capadano buries him with a quick turn of foot and stay away Faye just can't respond. And then he finally gets going again as they go up the hill. There is enough there. If stay away Faye is going to win this race, he's surely got to make all. I don't see any other way that he wins around this course at Cheltenham. I just, I think I'd be seriously concerned if there's anything in front of him as they come down the hill, because I just don't think he'll be able to get to his top speed quick enough to go with them. I do like Grey Dawning. I think he'll, you know, they'll give that a quieter ride. Monty Star, I'm sort of coming round to the idea that he might be a, a decent each way bet. I'm not convinced he's quite got the Grade One class to go and win this easily, but he'll probably run his race. But it, it all points back to factor file. I know we kind of like there's this sort of Willy Wonty Willy Mullins bingo, but I think with all of Willie's novices this year. I'll use an analogy that no one's ever used before, but this is exactly like Gillingham Football Club, who I follow avidly. A year ago, no one will know this, Gillingham Football Club, we're a League Two side, we're in mid-table. A year ago, we got taken over by an American couple, saved the club, pumped loads of money in, we signed loads of players, saved ourselves in relegation. And what's happened this season is we've got an absolute dearth of players covering every position, and we don't know our best team. So we rotate every week and we're inconsistent. What happened at the start of this season for Willie with all of his novices is he wasn't really sure what the pecking order was, which was going to go where, which one would want to trip. So he just let racing sort itself out. That has led to the situation that he's in, maybe more with the novice hurlers, but certainly with novice chasers as well, where he's just let the form tell him what to do. I think everything now points to the fact of far running in this race because the Turners, he's got other horses who could win a Turners. They may not, mm. but the likes of Basil Vega could win it. He's got the likes of Illete Tomps and Co. to run in the Arkle. Patrick's probably got his horse for the National Hunt Chase. This Brown Advisory, to me, looks pretty shallow. I can only really see one of four horses winning it. Therefore, Willie's got to look at this and think, if we've got factor file, we're confident enough to send him straight over fences. In a two-runner race, he's run a really good time. We can do the same thing. And as long as he's in contention at the top of the hill, his speed will be enough. So it's an unoriginal selection, but I really can't see. If Factor File turns up on the day, he's got to be odds on. So if you can have sort of six to four or so at the moment, why not? Paul, for you. Factor File's the one to beat now. Um, I think going up and triple, say, as we already touched on, I don't think it'll be an inconvenience at all. Stay away phase, the solid one. Um, I think it should be remembered he was given Capadano three pound. Not, not not much, but he, he was giving them three pound when he was beating them. That that on a strict piece of form, that is the strongest piece of form on offer in the book. He's the solid one. Um, I think he would want a real strongly run race and it to become a test. And again, with the likelihood or the possibility of us of a much smaller field than we used to get in these kind of races, that, that those kind of real battle hardened events that, that they're kind of maybe a thing of the past. So. Um, I think an old-fashioned um, real battle would have really have suited him. Grey Dornan already covered him, and I think I think there is a strong possibility if they're sitting at the ground soft that he could he could deviate to the other race. Monty Star, I thought, did take a big step forward from, and his two pieces of form are quite strong. I'd be slightly concerned again that he's coming from on that route from a beginner's chase just straight into um, this company, a bit like. Um, when Manella Indo was beaten in this race last year, a couple of years ago, he was a similar. Um, he had a similar profile in that he'd only won them. And again, like Adam, it's hard to see much depth elsewhere to the race. Really, if you look, you really are focusing on those top four, top of the markets. I'd have been interested in Embassy Gardens. Yeah, I thought when one um, Grange Clare West was ruled out, I did think there was a possibility that he could be switched to this race. But then, obviously, if it looks like Factor Files going to run, it doesn't seem likely. Um, and you're looking further down through the Broadway boy. I'd, I'd, prefer, I'd much prefer him to go for the National Lunch Chase person. I think the longer trip will suit him. Meeting of the Waters is probably interesting. He's got a plethora of entries. Um, I thought it was interesting yesterday that Willie spoke on the, uh, he was on the mic at the Grand National Weights Lunch yesterday and said, he actually asked him about him because he still needs to run again to qualify for the National. He needs to get that sixth run in. And he said he, it was the intention of going to Cheltenham, but he went to a, he, everything's left to Patrick in regards to that horse. And he said, Patrick wants to ride him in the Kim Muir, which I thought was bizarre because he's been given a mark of 147 for the it in. Um, the Grand National. And he'd been given a mark of 147. He was actually given an entry in the Toten Novices Chase or the Toten Novices Chase as it was. He was he was declared to run that day at Weatherby and was only pulled out on the day due to the ground. And he, the English handicapper had already assessed him as 147. So 
I, I can't see that being an option. So perhaps meeting at the walls will end up in the national lunch chase. Well, we'll get onto that race in a minute. But whether that has any kind of impact on where other horses end up, I think um, Embassy Gardens, wherever he goes, he he he's a horse who, who is, I wouldn't say taking me by surprise, but this season, but. I wasn't a huge fan of him over hurdles. He always looked like a, he'd be a better chaser than a hurdler, but I wasn't massively struck with him last year, but I've really liked how he's jumped in his two starts um, and he's won. But I think as things stand, I think we're probably better talking about him in the national and chase. And I think um, as you've both covered, I think Factor Files the one to beat here. National and Chase, Embassy Gardens has been cut to seven to four favourite. Best price is five to two. You can get it with two firms. Adam? Your thoughts on the national chase? This race, I mean, I, I think firstly the the spread of the number of runners I'd probably have is between six and seven. I don't think this is going to be a big field. Embassy Gardens is obviously the right favourite. He's probably the most likely winner. I'm not in love with him. I don't feel like he's a, a certainty in this. And I think, you know, maybe I'm a bit scarred from carefully selected a few years ago, but I just think this race kind of plays into the hands of of horses almost end up here by default that they kind of look at it and think well we'll give Patrick a ride we'll find something that stays and that'll do Salvador Ziggy I think is maybe a little bit overpriced on his overall form maybe the prep's not ideal but they did a similar thing with Galvin you know I'd ignore the the American Grand National Hurdle thing just put a line through that you you could see an angle with that that I, I kind of looked at this race and thought, who would it suit? Broadway boy, it would definitely suit, but I just wonder if he's been to the well a few too many times. You know, Twisty's pretty pretty aggressive with his campaigning. I'm not so worried about the Warwick race. I thought that was a bit of a mess. I don't think the track really suited. If he came back to his form, he'd definitely have a chance if he got rolling. The, the one I kind of lean towards a little bit is Kilbed King. I think he's just shaped like a horse who just wants an absolute marathon trip. Thought that runner Ascot was very similar, that he, he shaped quite nicely and just got outpaced. I'd rather back something at a big price here and just take my medicine. If Embassy Gardens is a grade one horse, then so be it. I'll live with it. But I don't really want to get stuck in at the current prices because I just don't think Embassy Gardens is a standout. And I think he's favourite because he's going to be ridden by Patrick Mullins rather than actually what he's achieved so far. The Embassy Gardens is one who actually been really impressed with his two chase starts this is a race when experience normally tells but we've seen as adam said there could be a small field and you've got to take that into account a couple of years ago statler was for that reason was probably a horse that people who follow the trends and statistics would want to take on but then ended up a six runner race so effectively we've seen plenty of horses like carefully selected who've ran who've had just two starts and come here short price but in them days you were like big double figure um, field sizes and again I think the size of the field will will be quite um, determined in, in in that regard with Embassy Gardens perhaps perceived lack of experience. Um, just looking through some of the others, uh, Floor and Port, I, I still wouldn't be surprised if he ran the stairs, to be honest. I think there's, mm-hmm. I think there's, a, there's a strong possibility that'll happen. Um, Salvador Ziggy is your, is your archetypal old National Hunt Chase style winner in the fact that he's actually had a similar profile to a couple of Gordon's winners. The busy campaigns early in the season or even through the spring summer um, and then given a lengthy break with this race in mind. Again, I'd be, I'd be like Adam. I wouldn't be wouldn't be reading his form through as American runner. Certainly his, his earlier form is what he deserves to be given respect on. I thought now he's tightened up. He's like, I think he's seven to one best price. He's fives in many places, whereas... I think less than a week ago he was he was double that price when he was looking like the each way option. So I don't know whether people have seemed to jump on the bandwagon with him and seen the kind of profile that he's got. Um, again, meeting of the water if he did turn up, he he would be of interest to me. Um, of those are bigger odds. Um, again, as I touched upon, Broadway boy, he's got plenty of course form. Um, I think stepping up in triple definitely suits him. He's got the right attitude for this race. He he would. He again either really loved the strongly run race with with a big field or would have thought like the old days of the National Hunt Chase. Um you've got to forgive his Warwick run, but um I think he'd had he'd had plenty of racing in the first half of the season. Um, and there was plenty of pace in that race. So I think I think again, like Adam touched upon saying he'd perhaps been the well once too often. But I think having been freshened up, I think that's a positive with him. So coming in on the back of a break, um, we know he goes well at the course. Um, he'd be one I'd, I'd definitely be looking at double figure odds, but I'd, I just 
looking at the top two in the market, Corbett's, Corbett's cross obviously has got bags of class and ability, but it just hasn't convinced me with his jumping so far this season. I know that the fall, um, his latest fall, was, was not, not from his own fault at all. The horse jumped across him and he had no nowhere to go. But just in his earlier race, he was just a bit slow. Maybe that maybe that is why they've thought about going up in trip. He'll have Derek O'Connor on board, of course, um, which is a, a massive positive in a race like this. And perhaps just going that slightly bit slower might help him. Um, and he'll be able to work his way into the race. He's got, he's got all the class in the world. But just in terms of what I've seen from jumping, um, I've really liked Embassy Gardens. I say I'd, I'd be quite... <laughs> I'd be keen to look at siding with him, perhaps, if he, even if he went down the Broadway route. So if he comes here, which seems in all likelihood, I think he is the most likely winner. Final selections for the National Hunt chase. Not quite four-miler. Adam? I'll go I'll go Kilbeg King each way. I just think he, he shapes to me like this is what he wants. We've got Broadway Boy probably going to run here, so it's going to be a proper test. It, it, I, I take Paul's point, and he's probably right, that you know if this becomes a match with Embassy Gardens, he's not going to beat him, but... I just think he's a bit of value each way because I just think he'll be staying on doing his best work at the finish. Okay. Corbett's cross for me. Paul? Uh, Embassy Gardens on the proviso that there aren't too many runners. <laughs> <laughs> there won't be. <laughs> which, 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 to be fair, in, in all, and obviously all the races we've covered, I can't see there being a huge field in any of them, really, which is slightly disappointing. Most of these Irish horses are going to go for the Irish Grand National instead. We won't get 10 runners this year. As things stand... Who is your leading novice chase bet for Cheltenham 2024? Adam Mills. Um, Factor Fall in the Brown Advisory. Paul. Go with Embassy Gardens. Factor Fall in the Churros. <laughs> Paul, what can we expect to get from the Weatherby's Cheltenham Festival Preview Guide 2024? As the previous years, obviously all 28 races are dissected and covered in detail. Um, and there is plenty of editorial content alongside various contributors. Jess Stafford, you've touched upon, she writes their breeding angles uh, feature, which is really good again. Rory Delargy, as articulate as ever, um, as he tackles banker or bust. Actually, this year he's covered more horses. He wanted to cover as many with, again, probably a debate for another day, but with the amount of short price favourites there are now, he wanted to tackle more than just two horses these days, so he's covered a lot more um, in that regard. Similar to previous years, and obviously Aintree is now included as well with the grade ones at Aintree Covered and the Grand National itself. And those all important stats that Norville spends hours putting oh, together. The stats are all there, yeah. Spring horse to follow. I've come up with 12 for the spring. Um, not just for Cheltenham. Uh, to cover in the format of jumpers to follow. So hopefully a couple of them might land a nice prize. You can get the Weatherby's Cheltenham Festival betting guide right now at weatherbyshop.co.uk and input the final Furlong podcast gravy train discount code. You get £5 off your purchase. And that's £5 off the book, the digital copy, or the book and digital bundle, which is the one that I go for. I like to have the book, but I prefer to have the digital copy. It's just easier to reference, quite frankly. The code that you need is FF24CF. FF24CF. Capital letters, all one word. Enter it now at weatherbyshop.co.uk and get your digital copy of the Weatherby's Cheltenham Festival Betting Guide right now. It can be in your inbox instantly weatherbyshop.co.uk from adam mills paul ferguson and myself emma kennedy i really hope you've enjoyed this episode of the final Frontal podcast if you liked it a like on youtube a subscribe on youtube same for the podcast apps as well likes and shares on social media too it's all we're asking of you really appreciate you spending time with us on the final Frontal podcast and greatly appreciate adam and paul's input we'll talk to you again very very soon on the final Frontal podcast look after yourself and each other god bless